Well, with the siege underway, Rochester takes on a whole new aspect. All the luxury is now gone, all the sense of fine living disappears. The palace now takes on the feel of a barracks. You've got maybe 100, 150 people crammed within these walls. So food has to be rationed. There's no extravagance, no feasting anymore. And at night, when people have to bed down, normally people sleep on the floor, but there are no rushes. There's no firewood to keep them warm through the night. They're wrapped up, huddled in their cloaks, trying to keep as warm as possible. the king was ready to begin his assault. We know exactly what he did first. From the start of John's reign, we have chancery rolls, which is a copy of every order that John sends out. We've got the date and the place so we can track John's movements exactly. So we know that John arrived at Rochester on the 13th of October. And on the 14th of October, he sent this writ, King to the men of Canterbury, we order you that, just as you love us, immediately that you see these letters, you will cause to be made by day and night all the picks that you can. And then here he goes on to say that the smiths in the city of Canterbury should stop all other work except for the manufacture of picks and send them to us at Rochester as quickly as possible, given by our hand at Rochester on the 14th of October, 1215. We can guess what those pickaxes were for. The king was going to try and force his way into Rochester Castle. John was a terrible king, and he wasn't a particularly good military commander either. But at the same time, he wasn't a man to be crossed. He could be cruel, he could be stubborn, and in this case, he proved determined. His men used their picks to get through the outer wall of the bailey and drive the defenders inside back to the keep. John knew that getting inside that thing was going to be a lot harder. Round one had gone to John. So how would Albini's men have coped with the pressure that the king was piling on them? You've been in situations similar to the ones that the men faced in 1215. So they've fallen back to the keep, the bailey's gone. I mean, how's that going to affect their confidence? Well, that would have sapped their morale. They have had one setback, and possibly they're now thinking about losing the battle. Tension will be mounting, and really, people beginning to get frightened. How do you cope with that kind of fear? Well, the first thing a soldier falls back on is his training. Training in battle drills, carrying out familiar routines, and, of course, looking to the example of other soldiers. Knights in the Middle Ages haven't necessarily faced anything like this because they're such rare events. How does a commanding officer try and keep the morale up when it's a totally new experience? Well, mainly through his physical presence and his own personal leadership qualities. He is the key figure. He has to instill confidence in the soldiers by displaying outward self-confidence in not only his own abilities, his soldiers' abilities, but also the outcome of the battle as well. So a man like William Daldini must have been a fairly charismatic figure to hold these men together for two whole months. Uh, command in this sort of situation, in a siege situation, must be one of the greatest challenges a military leader can face. But Albini's men had a lethal device that would have prevented the king from getting too close. It was a weapon that had recently made a huge technological leap forward the crossbow. Crossbows were probably introduced to England after the Norman Conquest. But since the late 12th century, a new method of construction had massively increased their power. What went before was a purely simple wooden prod, made of one piece of timber, and that would form the motive power for an early crossbow. So this would have been, the, the bow would have been drawn back this way? Ah, right, the bow would have been drawn back yes. this way, OK. And uh, what comes after this, after this? After that one? would have been a composite prod which was constructed of whalebone, yew or ash, animal sinew, and then a the whole lot will be wrapped up in parchment. So, in other words, they've got greater range, greater um, sort of power. You can get anywhere up to 270 metres. What damage could that do to a man or a horse? A man-at-arms on horseback. A crossbow bolt 
went through his armoured, one side of his armoured leg, through the other side of the same leg, through the armour again, through the saddle of the horse, and into the horse. So in other words, any guy who can afford one of these, who doesn't have to be a knight, can take out a king with a single shot. That's correct. And we know that because, we, you know, Richard I, you know, it, crossbow to the shoulder. It was totally against the laws of chivalry to be killed by an archer or a crossbow man. It's very unfortunate. Because they were lowborn, they were baseborn. Yeah. It just wasn't on, it, it wasn't a done thing. And that changed, changed the rules of warfare. Yeah. It's a great that, leveller, in other words, the I mean, crossbow. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah. But the big question for me is, are there any of these which I can fire? Please. They can all be fired because it's the wrong term to use. Ah. We shoot, we don't fire. Right, OK. OK, let's give you a replica of a hand-drawn 15th century. Nice and easy. All right, come let's have a go. Side. Yep. Now, how do I get the, uh, the drawstring back? Is OK. That... Put... Nose it down to the ground. Uh -huh. Put your foot in the stirrup. Yep. Now, keep him... I will keep the nut engaged, keeping both hands on the string. Mm -hmm. Draw back. It's only 110 pounds. Oh, nothing. Right, and a bolt. OK. Right, now, one of the things that occurs to me is this is quite straightforward, popping it in here and, and uh, firing it, shooting it, Please sorry. Please keep that thumb down. OK, let's keep the thumb down. What if you were on the top of a castle parapet, you leant forward and that happened? Beeswax in the groove, spit in the groove, or a bolt trap. A bolt trap, what was that? A bolt trap will be a thin sliver of cow horn uh -huh. secured to the tiller behind the nut. Ah, right, and so you've, you're always going to have something gripping the bolt there, so that's not going to be a problem. Yeah. OK, I'll put the bolt in. You okay. just worry about where you're going to shoot it. OK, is this roughly right? You just squeeze everything up. Oh, that's not bad, I hit the target. Crossbows were so despised that contemporaries claimed they had been invented by the devil. There's one particularly tabloid chronicler called Roger of Wendover who tells a tale about William de Albini and a crossbowman stood on top of Rochester Castle and the crossbowman having John within his sights. And he asks Albini whether he should kill the king. And Albini thinks on it and says, it's not for man to kill a king, that's for God to decide. Now, it's probably a made-up story. It sounds a bit dodgy to me. But it does show one thing. It shows that people were frightened of the crossbow and they knew how lethal it was, that even a lowly crossbowman was able to take out a king. Armed with their deadly crossbows and protected by Rochester's mighty defences, the rebels were proving to be formidable opponents. The king is going to expect a castle like this to surrender. He's going to expect the siege to end. John's got logistical problems of his own. He's, he, he can't just check all his army into a hotel. They've got nowhere to stay. He's got hundreds, maybe thousands of men out here in the open elements. He, he's got to feed them. He's got to keep them free of disease and cholera. It's a logistical nightmare. But John had the ultimate weapon, a terrifying engine of war. Hey! The trebuchet hey! would have struck fear into the rebels' hearts. Hey! And King John had five of them. At Caerphilly Castle in Wales, they have built an exact replica of this 12th century catapult. It can be quite unnervingly beautiful that this thing is really a very unpleasant war machine, but it looks so graceful when we're demonstrating yeah. it here. OK, loose! It's like a bowler bowling a cricket ball. It's incredibly graceful in a way, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It totally captivates you as, as, the, as the, 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 the missile leaves, but it's, as you say, a very deadly weapon. Right, OK, chaps, first positions. They work on the principle of counterweight. So in the ballast box, we have approximately two tonnes of rocks and soil. Well, the trebuchet was originally invented by the Chinese in about the 10th century AD. It was a very simple machine then. It didn't have a counterpoise box on it. It had ropes, and people just hauled with muscle power on the ropes. Heave! And it's the Arabs who devise the counterpoise box ah. as being a way of improving the mechanical Heave. efficiency of these engines. Right. So this is a new technology of the 12th century AD. At Rochester, John's got five of these, and, and this is a baby one. How big are John's ones going to be? This trebuchet here has an arm length of 20 Heave. feet. We know that the maximum size of these engines would have had an arm length of about 50 feet. They are the most devastating Heave. weapon of the Middle Ages. No one has seen anything like this before. Remember, we are definitely pre-gunpowder oh, yeah. artillery. This Heave. is the heaviest artillery that people have. 
Oh, so, so pretty heavy then. Yes. And it, now this is uh, made of stone? This is cast concrete. Oh, right. But the originals would have been carved stone, made by stonemasons, round because hey. they'll fly through the air better, and the same weight, so they'll hit the same target time after time. OK. How quickly could you load one? Ten minutes usually, if we really tried with a good crew, about six to eight. Six to eight. So yeah. if you had five of them, yeah. and you kind of worked in series, you could mm. almost have sort of one going off every minute. Yeah. OK, trigger's engaged. Okay. We're now going to disconnect the winch rope. Part of the effect of this is to demoralise people. You see this thing being built in front of the castle. You know you are going to be bombarded. It's not just stone balls coming over, it's rotting carcasses, the heads of troops have been out on a sortie, perhaps being hurled back. OK, bring the sling forward. They would have been very good at demolishing timber buildings and certainly the roof of a keep would have had little defence mm, sure. against the stone balls going through. Also, it will demoralise the people inside because they can't escape the bombardment. I think it looks like they're about ready to fire. I think Paul's waiting for someone else to help him to shoot the machine. Would you like to be the trigger I've, man? I, I've always wanted to fire a medieval trebuchet. OK. Good hide, Yang. And run away. Which way? Away from the engine is favourite. Right. Prepare the loose. Loose. Go on. Hi there. Prepare the loose. Loose. Oh, nearly. <laughs> OK, let's try again. Prepare the loose. Loose. Try again. Loose. One of the chroniclers, the Barnwell analyst, tells us that the barrage did not cease day or night. One of the reasons why the men in the keep held out for so long was because they were hoping the cavalry were going to arrive soon. The leaders of the main rebel army in London had promised that if John attacked, they would come and help. Some way into the siege, about 700 knights did ride out from the capital, but when they got to Dartford, their nerve failed. They turned and fled in terror. That says a lot for the size of John's army, that so many men would flee so quickly. Rochester's defenders were now on their own. John is pounding this keep with missiles. What's the commanding officer going to be doing? He would want to be visible and moving around his men in the most exposed positions, and he'll be wanting to direct action against the enemy. The last thing he wants is his men cowering behind these crenellations. He wants them engaging the enemy, taking the battle to the enemy. And we never must underestimate the effect of a few well-aimed shots striking the enemy. It will keep the enemy at bay, make their massive superiority less effective. But the king's giant throwing machines could not breach Rochester's 12-foot thick walls. The trebuchets had failed. What would John do next? The king was becoming increasingly fed up, but he had one more trick up his sleeve. He was going to drive a mine under the tower in an attempt to bring it crashing down. Undermining was with good reason the most dreaded device of siegecraft, but it took weeks on end, and the conditions the men worked in were dark, damp and dangerous. The process was so risky that it was only undertaken by the most determined commanders. But by now, King John was ready to go to any lengths in order to get at his enemies. Things are looking very, very bleak for William de Albini and his men trapped inside the keep. Now, this is only my guess, but I imagine they're probably out of firewood by this stage. They've burnt everything they can lay their hands on because it's getting cold or into the middle of winter. But I know for a fact that they've run out of food because the very reliable Barnwell chronicler tells us that the men have been reduced to living on the flesh of their own horses. And he adds that this was particularly hard for those that were used to fine living. So they're very, very cold and they're very, very hungry. How much longer are they going to be able to hold out against King John? The exact location of John's mine has long been a mystery. But this team of engineers and archaeologists is trying to trace it using a ground-penetrating radar system. By the time they've finished, we hope to have an accurate idea of the route the King's miners took. OK, Simon, you ready? 
Off you go. It's exactly the same technology we use for finding airplanes in the air, but now we're turning it upside down to try to find King John's mine under the ground. OK, keep going. One of those is the transmitter, so that's emitting a radar wave down into the ground. That hits something in the ground, say a change in the soil, and bounces back up, and the second one receives that radar wave. Have you found anything interesting here? Well, we're certainly seeing a lot of different things in the soil, but what they mean we won't know until we get the whole picture. Again, quite a nice signal coming through. An officer of my regiment, the Dorsets during the First World War, wrote, they didn't actually mind so much the sound of the mining, but what they really feared and really got worried was when they heard the mining stop, because that meant that the mine was just about to be blown by the enemy. We know that the mine was ready by the 25th of November because on that date, John wrote to his trusted servant, Hubert de Burgh. He said, we order you that with all speed you will send to us by day and night 40 bacon pigs of the fattest and least good for eating in order to bring fire beneath the tower at Rochester. It wasn't food that John needed, it was fuel. I very much doubt that Sir Hubert de Burr had to personally round up those pigs. But whoever was lucky enough to get that job, once they were at Rochester, they would have been slaughtered, their carcasses would have been boiled down, the fat poured into barrels, and the barrels packed under the keep with brushwood, bits of hay, other combustible material, and then eventually the whole thing set on fire. 